Michael Sassoto. I'm a physicist here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, I have been in medical physics uh, for almost 20 years now. I practiced for 10 years in Canada where I trained and then moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and joined Allegheny Health Network and have been there a uh, senior physicist for almost nine years now. Um, I lead the brachytherapy program here and we are heavy on GYN brachytherapy and it's my pleasure to fill you in on specifics regarding on central brachytherapy planning. Last week you heard from Derek and Dan regarding Varian, Varian's brachyvision and how to navigate through that and plan tenement ovoids and tenement ring cases and I'd like to do something similar today for on central brachytherapy planning. So I'd like to kick us up. First of all, again, everybody, can everybody hear me? I mean, you cannot. Um, just, I can see a couple of cameras here. Okay. Just want to make sure that I don't talk and, and uh, for some reason there is no, no connection. So I'd like to kick off uh, this uh, webinar with a tenement ring case, followed by a tenement ovoids case, and hopefully we have some time left yet at the end to talk about some unusual cases. And there, Claire was kind enough, Claire Dempsey from Australia, to share a couple of cases with me and that I can present in addition to a couple that I have here. Things to look out for. <clears throat> so having said all this, I'm going to share my Oncentra planning screen. Can everybody see this? This is currently loaded with a, a tenement and ring case, number one. And on the left-hand side, you're familiar with the controls, image, uh, contouring, image registration, planning module, evaluation, and export. So I'm going to go into the contouring module. You will see that the case is already contoured, that structures already exist, uh, in, just for the benefit of saving some time. And one thing I'd like to point out from the beginning, normally I have two screens available for, to myself, and up in the corner here, there's this, what I like to call a microwave symbol, which is, there you have layouts, preset, presets for layouts, and it's really helpful that if you have two screens available, you can click on it, of course, and on Centra will move unnecessary uh, details off to the side, or here I created an, uh, an ACS3 pane view side by side. So you don't have to manipulate your views in a in a way every time you start a case. That if, if you're if you're fine with a particular setup, then make sure you save it, and that's done under this hammer workspace. And you can t you can type in a name here, and then and hit save as, and it shows up in your new list. Okay, so just as an FYI, a little, a little tip, a little trick. <clears throat> so this, as you see, is contoured. I have in green here a high-risk CTV. Bladder volume was contoured. Blue is the small bowel. Rectum in brown and sigmoid in, in orange color. So another tidbit is, and I'm not sure how, how Varian Brachyvision does this, but often the oncologist, we, we, we share contouring duties. So either I, I contour structures here in Oncentra and then he comes and contours the high-risk CTV and usually we plan off of an MR scan that is on a computer screen beside him that was a diagnostic MR scan and for that he would like to see looking straight down the tandem and that one can do this uh, by picking, generating a view that's perpendicular to this tandem. And that is really easily done by hitting this perpendicular button, a point selection. You would, you would pick this top point here of the tandem and then scroll down to, to the bottom. And you can see the view changed. So on the left, I have my axial view in the middle of the coronal. On the right, I had the sagittal. So all I'm going to do is drag this new view to the left and go back to my reconstructed views and grab the sagittal view that I just lost and put it back here. 
And what you can see now is as I'm scrolling through the actual view on the left, you can see on the right-hand side here in the sagittal view that the plane I'm now scrolling through is beautifully bisecting the tandem. And the physician often likes to contour their structure, the high-risk CTV, for instance, in, in this view. The tools are grayed out right now, the pearl view, uh, for instance, for uh, contouring, because I don't have a, an actual CT slice sitting right here in this actual view in which the, the contours are defined. They are, I'd have to go back to my original images and just drag, drag it back here and you can see now the contours changed from dashed lines to, to solid lines, which means now my tools become available and I can change contours or I can add contours. Okay, so I wanted to point out the ability that you can cre create any viewing plane that uh, aids the physician in contouring. Uh, one more uh, piece of information regarding contouring, it is actually possible to, and we've done this in the past, to contour all the organs at risk in a different software, such as MIM Maestro, for instance, that, that we have. And the physician or a resident physician can do that while the physicist is already planning. That is, um, work load sharing, and in the end, what is, a, what is possible in OnCentra is you can marry the two data sets. You, while I'm in the planning module, already digitizing my catheters and uh, optimizing the plan simply on, on points, say point A based, the physician or the resident can be contouring organs at risk, even the high-risk CTV if they don't necessarily need this perpendicular plane to the tandem, and finish those contours in an external software. The key is that the case you're creating in OnCentra does not uh, have a structure set associated with it yet. That is, that is um, very important, otherwise OnCentra will not import that structure set that was created in a secondary software. But it has saved us about 20, 25 minutes by working in parallel while the physicist is planning the, the physician or an, an assistant, a, re, a resident physician, can do the contouring, and then you marry the two. So in this case here today, the contours are already established, and I'm going to go into the planning module. I'm going to create a new plan. You see I already have uh, existing plans here since I played with it. I want it to be prepared for you. So I'm going to create a new plan. So on Centra is setting up the planning module graphic user interface. And those of you who have planned already, you know there are two ways to plan uh, a case. One is by not using an applicator library model and then digitizing the catheters manually. Or in this case, this is the Oncentra ring and tandem. And we know from the lectures previously that during commissioning, you have to make sure you know where your source goes, especially in the ring. And for the Electa tenement ring sets of varying angles and diameters, we do know that Electa offers a um, library model with a source path function that is extremely helpful in planning the cases properly and sending the source to the exact location in the patient inside the ring that actually the, the planning system displays. So we don't have to, as long as you have those source path functions and applicator library model uh, available, then that's really straightforward and easy. And I'm going to limit the presentation today to this use of applicator library modeling. So I'm going to check this. The selected plan label is already in use. Okay, I'm going to have to give this a different label. That's okay. And <clears throat> We, of course, in picking the proper model, you need to know what ring and tandem were inserted. So I know it is a 45 degree ring, 34 millimeters diameter, and the tandem is 45 degrees and 60 millimeters long. So what if I pick the wrong one? It's easily fixed. So I'm gonna pick on purpose the wrong one with a tandem that's too short. And 
and I'll correct that in a second. <clears throat> so also you can see that the planes through which I'm scrolling right now are still the green, which is the um, CT coordinate system. I have to change to my ECS views. Again, I can do this here on the right by grabbing and dragging these views, or previously uh, a setup screen design, I can reload it, and here I've named it demo single screen. And once you're happy with a setup, again, use the <clears throat> little hammer setup button here, go to workspace, and save it. These are specific to <clears throat> each module in OnCentra. This, you see that the previous ones <clears throat> from the contouring module are not visible here because they're specific to the contouring module. So once I'm set up here, first thing I will do is take my ECS, it's an extra coordinate system, and in fact that's an applicator specific one as you will see. So I'm going to rotate it such that the applicator is bisected by the axes, and also I'm going to play, uh, place this origin here at the at the you know also at the beginning. So this is a this is a um, cervical sleeve that shows up radio peak here. So at the top of the ring, perhaps a little rotation yet. I want to place this accurately for a reason that becomes uh, apparent in a second. So I'm pretty I'm pretty happy with this. I check. I like to double click on each image and in fact then enlarge it so I can see well. And here on the on this view, scrolling through the images you can see we're we're tracking the tandem in the middle and then we're coming through the ring here and as the ring here's the hardware, the, the channels you can see in the middle, and I'm not quite lined up, so I will do that too. I will rotate this Z axis one more. Uh, time a little bit, and now I'm lined up in all in all views. So this would be the time now to, as you can see at the top here, while our pl contouring and planning and evaluation export modules on the left go top to bottom, in on Centra within each model, the controls lead you from the left to the right at the top. So the first one available now is applicator placement, and since we're using an applicator model, that's what I will start with. On the left-hand side, the applicator placement dialog pops up, and you can see um, here the applicator is locked, and I know that I selected an incorrect one, so I can use a drop-down list and go to the one that I really want, and it says changing the applicator removes the information for the current applicator, and that's quite fine because I know it was incorrect. So if you don't realize that you picked an incorrect applicator model, you will see that when you digitize points and, and the model actually shows up on the images, and then you can go back to this step, unlock the list, and pick the correct one. So once you have that applicator selected, the next step, again, from left to right, is you pick your anchor points. And I want to switch to another screen here for a second. Can everybody see the PowerPoint presentation again? So in Tandem and Ring, the anchor points are in the, in the applicator model library. At the bottom, you, there's a window where you can rotate a model of that applicator, specific applicator, whether it's a ring or a tandem or ovoids, and you can visualize these uh, anchor points. And here is shown, uh, the first one is the R lumen tip, AP1, ring lumen tip. That's the inside lumen at, that the source will travel through that, that path, and the very tip of that is the ring lumen tip. Here's also shown the ring center. On the next image, it's tilted a little bit. Again, here's the lumen tip and the ring center, and over on the right is the ring intrauterine tandem support. So it's really good. I simply just took screen captures of these in the applicator model library and saved them to my desktop so that I have them available for review 
because I often forget where exactly this point is, for instance, the ring intrauterine support point. So then I refer to it quickly, and then I can digitize the applicator properly in on Centra. And here, lastly, the intrauterine lumen tip, the top point, and if you have actually X-ray markers inserted, there's an additional point you can use, the first marker point. I don't have that currently. It doesn't show in in on center here in this case that I have loaded up. So for the ring lumen tip, and also what I like to do is I like to write, always work in big windows. So you see my cursor is already across here. It's looking for me to digitize that ring lumen tip. And if I accidentally place it, that would not be very helpful. So I like to undo the activity gadget at the top, just turn it off and then I can click in a window as much as I want and I can zoom in and find the center of that uh, airspace in the ring. I can turn my gadget back on and I will place my first applicator point. And as, it's be, as these points are being placed, you can see there's a check mark right next to it that tells you, okay, that point is registered and is um, accepted. So you don't, you don't really have to go in, or, in sequence. I'm going to go in sequence, turn my activity gadget back on, the ring intrauterine support is right here. And you can see on central places, the point I just placed is brown. I hope you can see this in the image. And, and on central places, based on my digitization, a green point, if these are far off from one another, you know that you're not in the right spot. In fact, I can hover over my brown one and drag it over here. You see it doesn't really like that. So close proximity of these two points as you're digitizing also tells you that you're, that you're doing the right thing. <clears throat> it automatically advanced to the ring center, so I can go back here and, okay, I may have been a little bit off. So that's good. The next one is the intrauterine lumen tip. And for that, I'll, I'll go back here. And I'm going to turn the ROI color wash off so I can see better. So the lumen is the inside of that airspace at the very tip of the tandem. So within reason, I might adjust as as um, on central suggests a different location for these points, but that's of course the geometry with the uh, a perfect geometry with the applicator not inserted in the patient, no stress, uh, no bending essentially. So the last point I will forego because I don't have the X-ray markers inserted. Move and rotate. So now I will just line this up. The rotation I can change if I want to. You can also move that point about which you rotate to where you think it's better placed. So I'm just looking at the tandem right now. And that looks pretty good in this view. My ring is wandering off a little bit, but I'm not too concerned with that right now. Just checking the tandem. And that's, that's centered well, I like it. So I realize if I now move the ring or rotate the ring, my tandem will move from its um, position that I placed it in. So in that case, there's on the left-hand side, you can select the mode by which you manipulate these applicators. So the first one moves the applicator as a unit. The second one, you can manipulate catheters independently. So I'm going to select catheter one, which is the ring, and now I can I can move it up slightly, and I can switch, in fact, to this view, and again, I need some translation here. Rotationally speaking, it looks, it looks pretty good to me.
So I'm actually pretty happy with where my applicator is positioned. And <clears throat> uh, let's see, I'm looking for Um, there's another way to visualize the applicator here. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Oh, here. Okay. So it, it's a certain combination of being an applicator placement module and on the left hand side having your applicator selected. On the right hand side, the applicator visualization, bottom right, you can see it's currently off. I can turn it on to transparent, and then you can see the applicator superimposed, especially when I turn the applicator placement task off. Now you can see this is the way OnCenter now places the applicator model and how it reconstructs it based on your digitization of where the anchor points are. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with this. <clears throat> so. I want to show you the power, demonstrate simply what you can do with a library plan. So previously, I have planned this all the way through plan A, uh, point A, and once you're done placing the applicator, then you can load up a plan that was previously saved. And the beauty of that is, you will see in a second, it places points A, it places any, any applicator points that you chose to digitize. If I zoom in here and I turn the grid on, it's a centimeter grid. You can see from the external OS here in the top of the ring, two centimeters up, two centimeters over, there's my point A. And they are mislabeled, looks like. Left is on the right and right is on the left. So what I'd have to do is change this here so we don't get our laterality mixed mixed up. So there's A right and points A right and left. And we also like to look at the dose to the vaginal mucosa. But so in simply loading up a li library plan, you can see that it populated sources in the ring it activated them and it also, once you update the normalization, currently the normalization is to uh, all points, the vaginal mucosa points as well as points A left and right. So that's pretty fast for coming up with a beginning, you know, sort of a base model for plan A and the the dwell times were chosen in that template plan as channel one, here's your ring, channel two is the tandem, such that it's 15 to 10, you know, two to, three to two loading. The ring was loaded basically with 15 seconds and then scaled, and you can see the bottom of the tandem here was initially loaded with 10 seconds and the four top positions with 20, 15 seconds, I'm sorry. And then the normalization to points A and vaginal mucosa points bumped the time up to 28 seconds and almost 19 respectively. But the relative weighting, as you can see, a one, two, three thirds and two thirds is maintained. That's the nice thing about a library plan. And <clears throat> the digitization of points A, et cetera, I will go through in the tenement ovoid, uh, ovoid case. So I would say, in the interest of time, since I see it's already going on 11.30, I'm not going to delete the plan. And basically, what I did with loading up a library plan, I won't, be do, won't do it for, from scratch right now. But you will see the same steps then demonstrated in the tenement uh, ovoids case. So you can see up here in the top left on the ring, I chose to use four dwells on either side. And that, in fact, this case, as you, if I load up the DVH, 
we can see bladder, the 2cc, and the rectum 2cc, sigmoid 2cc, and a small bowel. Unfortunately, the screen is so small, you can't see it all at once. Currently, this is not a plan I would treat because my high-risk CTV is only sitting at 88%. And what I would do now is, in fact, I can demonstrate quickly, insert a couple patient points, and let me just call them point A. And in fact, I already have point A, but these I cannot separately normalize to. So I, drop, I will drop one point directly over point A right, another one over point A left, and you can see them in your points list down here, P1 and P2. So now that I have these points, I could go to uh, the normalization, and instead of picking all applicator points, I can pick point A, and you see how the, how the distribution simply grew larger. In Brachyvision, there is a global scaling function, I think, Derek last week used the dose shaper, which we can also do here, optimization through graphical means. However, scaling all the treatment times or the dwell times in all applicators uniformly, you pretty much have to pick a point to which to normalize to. And simply by now normalizing to points A, you can see our high risk CTV coverage went up to 108% for D90. So that's nice coverage, but at the same time, here look at the sagittal view. We're also cutting deeply into the bladder. That's not healthy. And also the vaginal mucosa points are at about 150%. So if I switch to gray here, that would be 10 gray. So that also is too, too hot. So I would, I would cool this off as best I can. I know when we treated this case, it was really difficult to meet the constraints. I know we kept the vaginal mucosa hot in order to cover the high-risk CTV even with 95% uh, on the D90. But sometimes then you have to question, well, is the high-risk CTV drawn too large? And in fact, if I go to my ROI set here and hit calculate, which is the abacus symbol at the top, you can see the high-risk CTV here, green. On the right, you see the dose volume. That is 56 cc, that's big. And it's probably on the larger side. And so the bigger the, your target drawn by the physician is, the more difficult it may be to adequately cover it and yet at the same time spare your organs at risk. <clears throat> so here, without going into too much detail, but I would certainly step through this distribution and right here where my prescription isodose line goes into the bladder, I would graphically start to manipulate these dwell times. And uh, in a very localized fashion here on the left, you can see global versus local. And what I might also do, as you see, for instance, there's a little bit of extension here. So this patient would have probably benefited from using uh, needles in a ring applicator. But this applicator, as you can see here, there, there's no place for needles. And what one can do also is posteriorly here, as long as you have room on the rectum, which we do, <clears throat> the rectum 2cc is 3.9. Well, that's about where I would like, for this case, 700 centigrade times 4 would be our um, treatment prescription that, that calculates with 45 gray external beam treatment for, the, for an EQD2 to be maintained in an acceptable range would be about 3.94 gray for the rectum 2cc. Sigmoid is already at 4.7, so that's a bit hot. And you can see as I'm scrolling up, the sigmoid is very close here. So I'd have to really back off from the sigmoid and from the bladder, and then spend some time fine tuning this dose distribution. So I would like to Stop and see if anybody has any questions before I move on to the tandem and ovoids case. So you can unmute your mic or type a chat message if you want. <clears throat> I'll just wait a little bit. And if there are no questions, that's, that's great. I will load up the other case and just give you, give you a chance to type in a question or, or unmute your phone and ask if you so desire.
Okay, if there are no questions, then let's move on to the Tamar Novoids case. Okay, again, here we have our structures already in place, organs and risk in our target. So this, this is the, you know, the module you'd spend some time in, or your physician contouring structures. So let's go right into planning, <clears throat> create a new plan. For our tandem and ovoids cases, <clears throat> we do not use an applicator library model. Instead, we use x-ray markers inserted into both the left and right ovoid and the tandem. That is what we did during commissioning. And if one was to use an applicator model from the library, again, the nice thing is that you can predetermine your point A because they're tied to the applicator itself and potentially also your vaginal mucosa points and then have standard loading saved in a template plan and load that up. So that's, that can be a time savings, although you're spending a little extra time rotating the tandem and the, both ovoids potentially individually and trying to line those up with the image uh, from your CT scan or MRI if you're planning on that. So that there's some investment of time necessary, which here um, I think it might be less time consuming to digitize X-ray markers in these images, um, but that all depends on practice. Okay, so first of all, we need to line up our applicator and if you if you don't know how to zoom and move shift all views at once in on centra I'm I'm holding down the shift and the alt key on the keyboard and I right click the mouse and zoom at the same time and I hold shift and alt down while I left click and drag the images I find that quite useful in manipulating all views uh, at once. All right. So here's our tandem. If you don't like the um, window level setting, there are others available in this drop-down list. The one that I really kind of like is uh, the pelvis one, because I can see the x-ray markers, which are going to be important for me for digitizing my catheters and most distal dwell position. I want to be lined up well. That looks good to me. Check back here. Somehow I moved off center again. There. And also I want to check where my ovoids are. I rotate in the actual view usually so that my ovoid channels are parallel to the tandem. I and the reason is to, well, that'll become clear in a second. <clears throat> so I am lined up with my tandem here. So now I need to digitize both po points A as well as my catheter channels. So since I'm set up here in the coronal view, I may as well, so I see better, 
change my window level a little bit. I'll start with digitizing my uh, catheter reconstruction. So you see also, since we didn't use an applicator model from the library, the option applicator placement is not available. So the first available to you is then your catheter reconstruction. I will have a total number of three catheters, which then were created here in the bottom. And I want to be for the tandem in, in Electaland for GYN applications, while in Oncentra, the catheter is numbered one, two, and three in on the actual afterloader, we have to make sure we map this to the correct channel because the guide tubes, transfer guide tubes are keyed and channel one will only go to the right ovoid, channel two will only go to the left ovoid, which is uh, catheter three on the afterloader and the intrauterine tandem will only go to channel five on the afterloader. So while, we, uh, while we're here, I may as well put in my prescription 700 and unclick default mapping and change my channel numbers for treatment. If I don't do this and it's not caught during a physics second check before this goes to the machine for treatment, the afterloader will complain and you will have to go all the way back to your drawing board and fix it here in planning. You cannot fix it on the, on the actual unit. And also while I'm here in the prescription, actually in catheter reconstruction, I will adjust my indexer length, which is the length of the overall, the overall length of the applicator for all GYN cases, uh, it's 1300. <clears throat> so turn my color wash off so I can see well. And I'm gonna start with channel three, which is my tandem. Make sure my activity gadget is engaged and I can see my cursor changed. And here's my first x-ray marker and I look for the center of that down, this, down the tandem. That is my most distal dwell. That's an important location to digitize accurately. If I place that too far up here, then my dose distribution will be incorrect. So during commissioning, that is where you establish that either if you use an applicator model from the library, that you can, based on that, place your most distal dwell position accurately, or if you use x-ray markers, which we did, then I know it's in the center of this x-ray marker, as long as it's inserted properly, and that I make sure during CT simulation that that is done. And how do you insert these x-ray markers properly? The manual tells you you feed them into each channel, and before you let go, I mean, you, they, they click, they actually click into place, but you give them two full turns so that the, x, the strand with the opaque markers has a chance to relax inside each channel, and it's as straight as possible. So I digitized just a little bit beyond the uh, bottom of the Smith sleeve here, uh, but of course we're not going to load down there. And now um, in this view, if I scroll down to my ovoids, I can see the center x-ray marker. So I'm in the center of these ovoids. Zoom in a little bit so we can see better. And if I stay in the sagittal view, I can simply scroll over, engage my fine scrolling tool on the right here, and place that right smack in the middle. And now when I'm here in my sagittal view, I can uh, make sure I'm on the right ovoid, which is index one, channel one. And I can go into the sagittal view, turn my activity gadget back on, which I turned off so that I wouldn't accidentally place a catheter point and digitize where my sources will go. The loading is within these ovoids right here, you can see. You don't want to load outside of them, yet I do digitize the channel, as you can see on the bottom here, a little bit further than where I'm gonna load. And now that the right one is done, I can switch over to the left one, there I am, and I make sure that I'm now digitizing number two, otherwise I would be continuing number one. So it'll tell you because the number would change, uh, would remain one right here while you're
digitizing channel number t number two, and if this shows up as one or some other number, you know that you've made a mistake, and you can right click and delete the point, and and basically correct the selection of the applicator, uh, the catheter, and then continue uh, properly. Also, what I like to do is um, I'm going to be fine here. I like to digitize the length of the right and the left ovoid channels differently so that in the in the 3D view here that they show up oops it makes me quite uh, dizzy here let's see let's zoom in so that they that they show up with different lengths and the plan checker can then make sure that based on the patient icon on the right here showing head first supine looking from the feet here a little bit that truly the right ovoid is number one left is number two and also in the window explorer window at the bottom here you can see that the right ovoid was only the channel for the right ovoid was digitized to the 260 millimeter position while the other one was digitized to the 250 position so it's a visual check that your assignment of laterality is accurate Okay, so now that we have that, <clears throat> we can move on and activate. One, two, three, four, five. Left and right ovoid, activate with five sources, space five millimeters apart. I'm gonna go back to the view. There we go. I'm going to turn color wash back on. And the tandem, <clears throat> let's see how far we need to go to go down to the sleeve. Okay, there's one too many here. So I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to load protruding sources. Whenever you have a flashing notification triangle here, it means something is not uh, right, not happy. Hit update. Currently what it's done, it has simply loaded all 12 positions with the same time. Okay. So that's not very useful to us. And so we can go into optimization and put in our standard loading by using the manual dwell weights and times optimization. I'm going to start with 15 seconds here and the bottom of the tandem. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten positions. And the bottom here I'll give 10 seconds, like a 15-10 loading. And on the ovoids, depending on the size of the ovoids, this time here, I'm going to choose 10 seconds, similar to the bottom of the, the tandem. And for normalization, I can't use points A yet because I don't have them digitized yet. So let's do that quickly. For that, I'll go into this view. I'm going to turn those, turn off what I don't need. I'm going to turn on my grid. So like patient points, I'm going to set up two different rules. One that contains only point A and everything else in a different point set because I'd like to be able to digit normalize to point A. And again, you cannot change the spacing of this uh, grid. If you go to view, it's the show centimeter grid, control K, so the grid will as far as I know, always has a spacing of one centimeter. I looked through the settings, there was no place that I could adjust the grid spacing. So move up two centimeters, over two centimeters um, for a right, to the other side, a left, as you're used to. And again, under points, I like to rename them so I don't mix them up. 
here they are. And while I'm while I'm at it, get, so you see your cursor is still across here. And in order to not accidentally drop a point for this point set, I'm going to turn it off. That's that little green pen up top. You can simply click it, and your your gadget is deactivated. So at the same time, I'm here sh showing a cut through the ovoid, and if I measure the distance into tissue, five millimeters, that is where I like to place a vaginal mucosa point to where we want to keep our prescription, the EQD2 of 85 gray, to this point at five millimeters or, or, or cooler, of course. Other, another option is, and I'm going to call the second set point set just points. So here, here's my vaginal mucosa point on the right. I can take this, drag it over to the other side. Sometimes you may have packing around the ovoids, and then the tissue doesn't hug them. So you have to scroll through your your anatomy and see if if this is truly then your vaginal mucosa point. Some folks like to put that mucosa point right on the surface of the ovoids, and then you're looking to uh, limit the dose to that location, I think to about 140 gray EQD2. I think in the past, quite often, the vaginal mucosa was over-treated, was overcooked, and I'm sure complications resulted from that. So if I go here, I'm just gonna call this vaginal mucosa point right. <coughs> vaginal mucosa point left, and I could also digitize next point B. For sake of saving some time, I will leave that, leave that B. What I would do is rotate the coronal view so that my anatomy now is uh, straight, and then I would go from the center of the pelvis left and right two centimeters because our points B, as you know, are anatomy. They're locked to the anatomy, not the applicator, whereas points A and the vaginal mucosa points follow the applicator around. So one, and of course, you know, maybe I need to do this after all because I have no rectal uh, reference point yet. So having said that, I will do this. If I zoom out, you can see bisecting the femoral heads, roughly the same. Okay, so here's my my geometry. <clears throat> and on the sagittal view right here, my ICIU um, reference point is perpendicular to the long axis of the patient and it's five millimeter behind the rectal paddle. So if I scroll off to a, an ovoid, there's my center x-ray marker. So I want to cut right through the ovoid and go back to behind the rectal paddle. Here's the center of my applicator. So I want to go from this point and I'm, I'm just eyeballing the direction perpendicular to the paddle thinking the paddle and looking at the little icon in the top right, the long axis of the patient um, is approximated by the rectal paddle. So here, here's 4.8, that's 5.1 millimeter. So points, I'm going to create one more point and call that my ICRU rectovaginal point. Okay. So some folks like to track the dose to that point. <clears throat> okay. So now that I have that,
So Okay. <clears throat> Turn it off. So we have our standard loading, and what we can do is normalize it to point A, and voila, there it is. Now, would I treat that way? No, because it's too hot. If I load up my those volume histogram, and I apologize for this being so small, but everything is cramped into one screen here. I hope you can see that. So their high-risk CTV D90 is 137%. Um, that's uh, really, really hot. The bladder is hot as well. 6.9, almost 7 gray. The sigmoid, 5.6. The rectum is actually really low. So, but obviously we are really over-treating here. So now what one can do Again, in Brachyvision, you would take your global scaler and simply drag on isodose lines and it, it scales everything. Now, we don't have that nice a tool here, even though for optimization, uh, you could go to graphical and hit global, but what that does, it takes more, if I was to grab, say, an isodose line here in the coronal view up top right, I'm not gonna do that right now, but just talk about it. It, local, of course, affects only these local few dwell positions, but global doesn't scale everything uniformly. So for that purpose, I would simply create another point set. I would make it a patient point and call it, say, scaling. And in, in this view, if I maximize it, say I, I drop it somewhere here close to the outside of my higher CTV because I'm anticipating pushing this isodose line, the red isodose line, my prescription through that point. So in fact, now I can go to normalization points and just pick scaling, and now it does that. So am I happy with the, the overall shape yet? Maybe not. Let's see uh, the vaginal mucosa where that is at. I'm going to add, I know for this case, 45 gray external beam uh, dose to the pelvis and we were giving um, 700 centigrade times four. So the vaginal mucosa to get 85 gray EQD2 needs to stay at or below 5.88 gray. And oh, that's the percentage. That is certainly wrong. So let me go back in and delete this. So I'm gonna to switch to dose. 700 is the prescription isodose, and 588. So there's, there's my orange line, and currently I'd be quite happy that I'm not over, overly cooking the vaginal mucosa here. We are at about at 108 for the high-risk CTV, and remember, this is still standard loading, just rescaled. So this is not a bad plan. The bladder needs to stay, uh, let me see. There are, by the way, there are presets for these, those volume histograms that you can create. You can create, here's one tenement ring, 700 times four. And in fact, I have entered also more of these traffic light warnings because we, we frequently do treat 700 times four for, with external beam being 45 gray. If I load this one up, it shows me additional uh, visual feedback that says, oh, my small bowel, which I'd like to keep for the 1cc at 3.3, 330 gray, uh, centigrade, sorry. Sigmoid, I think it's 3.9. Rectum, 3.9 also to get uh, in fact, I think I have this. Let me share this with you quickly. If I switch back to this screen, 
Then here we have a simplified version of the EQD2 sheet. Um, there's so much more information in the one that Adam shared, and I said definitely uh, encourage everyone to use those spreadsheets. For simplicity's sake, here 45 gray delivered at 1.8 gray in 25 fractions, and the goals being listed here on the left, 65 gray EQD2 for sigmoid and rectum, bladder 80, small bowel, the 1cc at 60, and the vaginal mucosa at 85 gray EQD2. And it gives us goal doses for each HDR fraction, which is entered here as four, four times seven gray. And so I'm looking for 588 for the vaginal mucosa or 5.5 gray for the bladder, 3.9 gray for sigmoid and, and, and rectum. And of course, one can play with these numbers and see for, from a physician's point of view, what is acceptable for a specific patient for a specific implant. So at this point, one can, it's already noon, so we are running uh, really low on time. <clears throat> At this point, let me just mention I would go to local graphical optimization. I would cool off the tip of this implant because I'm really over-treating there. I would make sure that the bladder is not too hot. So I would bring, I would bring in these isodose lines, especially up top here. and thereby shape my, so even just by taking those off the top of the implant, as you can see, now bladder, rectum, sigmoid, small bowel, all are uh, acceptable. My high-risk CTV has suffered slightly, and I could probably find uh, a place that I would drag a little bit. And again, so here, this is a case, unlike the tenement ring case, this, this would be fairly easy to plan and optimize and get something really, perhaps even dose escalated. While you maintain your uh, organ at risk doses, I would be able to get not just 101% to D90 out of this plan, I would probably get 105 or one, even 109 out of this. So this was uh, geometrically a good implant, good volumes, and quality in, quality out. When you have a poor implant, and in addition, perhaps contour structures are uh, contoured poorly, then the saying garbage in, garbage out truly applies and we're not doing our patients um, a great service. So with a critical eye, review the implants. I'm going to save this and in, if you're able to stay on for a few more minutes, I would like to open up briefly for questions and then if uh, time permitting, I would like to show you one or two um, unusual cases. Are there any questions? Don't forget to unmute your, your uh, microphone. Well, either I have been extremely clear in what I've been talking about, or I put everybody to sleep, and that's not good. <laughs> I hope I hope the former was the case. Are folks still listening? I'm just wondering.
All right. Well, I'm glad you're still there. So, if you have if you have to go at some point, that's okay. I'd like to take perhaps 10 minutes or so to look at some unusual cases. And so here, if you look, I'm still sharing my screen, I believe. Yes. So cases. There's one applicator not inserted far enough. That's an, a case from Claire. And I'm just going to go into the contouring module here quickly. This is MR based. And I'm going to use just three panes side by side, so hopefully you can see this well. One thing you will notice, I just clicked on the axial view, and when I scroll through it, on the far right, the sagittal, you can see it's actually the, the true slice is uh, perpendicular to the tandem. And that's how they that's how they get their MR scan reconstructed. So that's quite helpful because the identification of the high risk CTV and the GTV uh, is, I believe, uh, actually, if you look at this, this, it was originally contoured in not in this view because you can see how the contours are cut off in a different plane. So that's actually surprising that it wasn't contoured that way. Anyway. So I'm, if I take turn these ROIs, so the color wash off for a second, then what you can see as I scroll down here in the uh, axial view, there's the ring. It's showing up dark on MRI. And in the center is the tandem. And you can follow it up on the left still. There's the blue or cyan colored CTV, uh, I'm sorry, it's the GTV that's slowly disappearing, and the intermediate risk CTV is showing up, and then that's where the tip of the tandem stops. On the right-hand side, where are we here? Right there in the middle, you can see it, and in this view, in the central view, you can see that basically at the bottom of the intermediate risk CTV is where the tandem ends. So the entire applicator was not inserted um, far enough, which then, of course, makes it impossible to cover the distal, uh, the, or the more the superior aspect of your target volume. And in this case, it would have to be uh, reinserted, redone. When you see the scan, this geometry would give the planner a huge headache, and you would not be able to deliver the dose as planned uh, per protocol to the target area and the, the physician would not be happy with this case. I want to bring up another one. Just copy this. This, in fact, was a, a perforation. <clears throat> So critical review right at the CT scanner or the MR scanner is, is key to getting, getting a good plan done for the patient. So oh, these are two sagittals. Let's see. OK, so here's the axial. And as I'm actually probably in the coronal view, you can see it best on the very right. So here's the, here's the ring. And you can see there's some packing that holds everything in place nicely. However, the tandem goes off to the left here. In fact, this is the uterus, and it's not even in the uterus. So in the sagittal view here, the higher, the better quality, you can see the tandem here, the channel coming through the ring, and then it ends up over here, which if I scroll up right here in the actual view, it's off to the patient's right, whereas the, the uterus is over here. Of course, that's an, that you abort the procedure, the patient has to be put on antibiotics and has to heal, 
and and hopefully and usually those scans get reviewed by radiology at least in our clinic if we have something like that happen i think it last time was a few years ago here but we we have had perforations so then in fact let me show you one one perforation we had actually not not long ago <clears throat> and This is not even this is not even a tandem from a tandem and ovoid to a tandem and cylinder set a tandem and ring set. Sorry, this was a simple vaginal cylinder. The patient has had the uh, hysterectomy, and the sutures must may, must not have healed up fully, so that. <clears throat> You can see here on the right-hand side that the cylinder is inserted way too far, and it should probably it should probably end right about at this level. So the dome plus a segment, it's it's too deep. So the sutures burst open, and the patient really didn't complain, didn't have any pain. As soon as we saw the mm -hmm. the yes. Was there a question? Okay, if not, so wanted to just show this that that also needs to be recognized you know, immediately, and this was a an abortion of the procedure as well. The patient needed to heal for a few weeks before I think she was actually given external beam therapy for um, a boost. And finally. <clears throat> Here's an interesting case <clears throat> that is also from um, Claire in Australia in an, in an MR case where the patient actually had a retroverted uterus and the implant geometry was very different from what you would normally uh, expect to see. <clears throat> okay, so here on the right-hand side, you have the sagittal view, view and in, on the left is the axial view. And, and what we're looking at <clears throat> is, you can see the, the little icon of the patient geometry on the top right. So here in the sagittal view, this is posterior where you see the rectum and there's contrast. But that may not be contrast, but never mind, that's an MR image. So here's contrast in the bladder, this is the anterior, the posterior. And you can see the, there's a lot of packing here, but what is interesting is here you can see the, the tandem from the ring and tandem. Here's fluid in the uterus, and normally the uterus is turned anterior, right? So this is a retroverted uterus, and what they did there is when you scroll through the images, you can see the tandem channel is actually anterior, and the, the ring channel is posterior. So what they did is hope the applicator together properly, but rotated inside the patient 180 degrees so that the tandem would point posterior and so they could treat their, their intended target. You can see the rectum is beautifully, like it's fabulously displaced by the packing. If anything, you're turning this applicator around, hopefully without causing the patient too much discomfort, if anything, you're closer to the bladder here potentially, but they were able to treat this. And then interestingly, on subsequent insertions, the uterus was no longer retroverted, but they used the applicator as intended with the tandem pointing anterior. Just different, sometimes you run into anatomies that are quite perhaps different from the norm. Also, especially what I found with tandem and ring setups, they are not as stable necessary in terms of keeping the tandem straight inside the patient. They can sometimes veer off to either the left or the right 
and be tilted and rotated quite badly depending on the patient's anatomy, whereas tandem and ovoids, they seem to maintain geometry with respect to the patient long axis better or it's better for the physician or easier for the physician to manipulate anatomy slightly to make it, geometrically speaking, a more appropriate implant. But so here were, those were a few cases that you might come across and then, of course, you need to you know, critically review your images and see is either an applicator not put together well, that for instance, I guess as, as Derek was showing last week, you know, a tandem that got unhinged from the distal end of the ring and then hugs the, the outside of the, the ring on the inside so that it doesn't go centrally through the ring, that could be a showstopper. He said in, in their case, it was all packed well and kept in place and they were able to treat with this geometry. And also it depends on how busy your clinic is. He said you know, they have t at times 10 plus cases and then the physician will likely be very reluctant to take everything out and start over, which adds at least another half hour to the procedure. And so I, I consider myself lucky that I have a good relationship with our physicians here that when I see something like that that geometrically is not okay, I will stop it, I will have them take it all out and put it back in for proper implant geometry. Again, garbage in, garbage out, so make your life easier by having good implant geometry from the start and then you can give your physician a really good plan. There's a question here from George from um, Ghana from um, SGMC. For a retroverted uterus, can one go ahead to plan if the physician is finding it difficult in tuning it and turning it 180 degrees? Well, you will end up with with an image data set. So if in this case, like, like Claire's physician did, that they would manage to rotate the applicator and have the tandem point backwards, then you, you essentially have good implant geometry, reproducible geometry for that fraction from the time of simulation, the CT or MR scan in this case, until the patient's actually treated, which is a good hour plus down the road, and you don't want anything to move, uh, or potentially, especially since this is a ring in a tandem, that it might you know, rotate out of alignment from what you're planning. So you want to make sure that your implant geometry as imaged is also the geometry in which you're treating. And if it's, if it's solid and reproducible, then as they did in, in, in Newcastle, then they went ahead and planned it and treated it. But if the physician is in the first place not able to use the applicator and put it insert it or rotate it into a non-standard geometry, if you're not able, then, you're, then you have to regroup and, uh, and see if you can, instead of you know, tandem and ovoids, maybe move to a tandem, uh, tandem and ring, move to tandem and ovoids, or perhaps, uh, again, it depends on the intended target volume and location, maybe a uh, tandem and cylinder might work. So you have, the physician has uh, multiple options at their disposal and um, if one doesn't work, perhaps the patient geometry permits a different one to be used with which you can still cover your intended target area. I hope that answered your question, George. And please, uh, if there are any other questions, you are more than welcome to email me here on the screen. I'm sharing, there's my email address. And I have to give credit, of course, to Claire. I stole her slides and just put my pictures in the slides. So Claire, thank you very much. But do not hesitate to email me and I'd be delighted to get in touch with you and discuss any of this further. Seeing that it's already 12.20, I thank you for your patience, that you stayed online and I commend all of you for uh, sticking with the program, with the uh, curriculum, which was uh, quite extensive and covered a lot of things. I have to say for myself personally, I learned a lot, and this was not just really for your benefit, it was also for the teacher's benefit to A, refresh existing knowledge, but also to go way beyond that and, and, and really put a, put a bow on this beautiful package 
of this HDR brachytherapy teaching curriculum for GYN malignancies. So I thank all of the previous presenters and speakers for a job really well done and for Adam uh, and Ben spearheading this and, and um, doing a fantastic job putting this together. So with this, today's presentation is concluded. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Michael. You're welcome.